You must stay at home. Stay at home. Hello and welcome to Lockdown, hosted by Steve Bonford with Mike Davis-Marks. Our armed forces operate in challenging environments. Week by week, we'll explore what we can learn from their experiences. Morning, Steve. Who have you got for our next podcast? A chap called Ian Cumming, who I believe you don't know. I must belong to the RAF if I don't know him then. He does, well, belong. He served in the RAF. So if you could just restrain your insults, please. (laughs) You know how much I love and and admire and respect the RAF, as, as you said. I do. You're, you're champing at the bit to say something, but let's not. You can save that for later and let's hear what he's got to say. Ian, thank you so much for agreeing to come on the podcast. I can't recall when we first spoke, but I think this might be over a year, maybe two years in the making. Uh, uh, certainly over a year. Yeah, it's nice to be here, Steve. So thank you very much for for being extremely patient. Um, but we do have a couple of excuses, both of us, in fact, from uh, we've got a teacher's note, or if you want to call it that, because we've both had COVID, more of that later, I suspect. <laughs> but first of all, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself, your time in the RAF, and um, what what stories have you got? What can you tell me about it? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I joined the RAF back during the Cold War in 1986. You know, it was... Uh, Around the time of Frankie goes to Hollywood and uh, the, the threat of uh, Russian invasion and, and uh, thermonuclear war. But I, I sort of joined up at a sense of public spirit and, uh, you know, bought his own adventure, quite frankly. And I actually wanted to be um, a, a pilot. So I graduated into the, the Air Force in, in early 1997, uh, sorry, 80, 87. And um, oh, time flies. And uh, in very short order, I was it was made quite clear that I wasn't going to be a, a good pilot. Uh, I was it was good with my hands and eyes and coordination. I could fly the plane. I just wasn't very good at following any of the procedures or or navigating. And you know that's that's a you know a fundamental flaw in in a Royal Air Force pilot these days. So they um, they sent me off to a base at RAF Lucas, big operating base at the time, and uh, said go and have a look at the, uh, the other branches in the Air Force and see what you like. So they sent me to air traffic, which I hated, just sitting in a, a goldfish bowl or then sitting in the dark. And it was the um, the first Friday of my stay at Lucas that I went to the, uh, the the bar and met a bunch of guys dressed in camouflage with cam cream, to, just smeared uh, remnants of it on their faces in, in happy hour. And this was the RAF regiment who seemed uh, larger than life and certainly larger than the bar. And uh, I met their uh, commanding officer um, who <laughs> had an unusual approach to to, uh, to dealing with banter in the bar, which normally involved uh, throwing pilots out of windows and things. And I was just kind of smitten by this, um, his, let's call it Joie de Vivre. And um, he kind of took me under his wing and kept me holding it at his at his squadron, 27 squadron. Uh, and they got me fit, uh, fit enough to, to go to my junior regiment officers course uh, at Catrick in those days, uh, six months there. And then I was chucked out back to Lucas for this band pot to look after me again and uh, teach me all about, you know, what the RF regiment is about. And, you know, the RF regiment um, gets a lot of, Gets a lot of ribbing from uh, the the army and the marines, but you know they, they really have made a profession of what they call force protection. Um, you know, in the in that day it was ground ground uh, defense, air defense, um, you know, nuclear, biological, and chemical defense, and so forth. And they were very very good at it because all the 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 bases during uh, the Cold War were liable to be attacked by Spetsnaz or or um, chemical weapons attacking so so they were they were very good at what they did um but in short order i was um within six weeks of arriving on that that squad and i was sent out to to belize where uh, i was to take my my men 35 guys eight, ranging in age from 18 me at 21 and uh, the oldest about 55 uh, and just to to look after them and look after the air defense of belize international airport and and that was boys on adventure just you know a, a great time living in the caribbean work hard play hard you know crashing hangovers 
<laughs> on a Saturday morning when the troops expected you to take them out on their compulsory R&R, &R, lots of bouncing around on speedboats to get to Caribbean Keys, uh, swearing you would never drink again, and then uh, you know, t 10 minutes of lying on the sand in the sun, beads of sweat coming out, you go, I can murder a pina colada. <laughs> It was um, it was great. Uh, the the um, the regiment looked after me well, gave me a good foundation in you know, looking after sort of multi skilled teams. And the the, the regiment do things a, a different way. You know, they've got uh, medics and engineers and logisticians and administrators all within one uh, deployable unit. So it was you know a, a good grounding in, in dealing with lots of people from lots of different backgrounds. And and you know people within the regiment, some of them were very plummy. And came from um, you know uh, families with um, a history uh, that you know goes back many generations of military pedigree, and some had very definitely come from the uh, the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, and you know it was kind of last last ditch stop for them uh, with some uh, other other uh, institutions that um, might otherwise have been taken up a lot of the time. They had, had a, a great time there. Uh, ended up getting sent from that to work with the the RAF police. Uh, do training them in, in military tactics. The the, uh, the RAF police and the RAF regiment have had a, a long, long history of uh, uh, rivalry. Uh, we've we've been a good customer base for them <laughs> when it comes when it comes to things happening in the the NAFI and so forth. I can I can remember um, at one one point we were off on a, a missile practice camp in the Hebrides, and a young chap had been. Uh, uh, only just graduated into the regiment and he uh, was sent to work with the RAF police because his weapon, his rifle had a night sight, which was all very new at the time. Uh, the police didn't have that. So he was on patrol with them doing perimeter security and so forth. And when we came back, we found that he'd, um, uh, he'd, he'd been seduced by the police and decided that he wanted to, to re-roll. And that was, that, that was just, you know, criminality in, in the squadron commander's eyes same squadron commander I mentioned to you. Um, and he said, well, if he's going to go, um, he's going to go, but let's have some fun first. <laughs> so this, poor, this poor guy, I was the adjutant at the time, and he got I marched into my office and I closed the blinds. It was like something out of um, um, Top Gun. You know, what I'm going to tell you now could cost me my job. I said, I understand uh, from your uh, record of service book, you're a, a, a scuba diver. He said, oh, yes, sir, I'm a, I'm a sports leader. I said, right, OK. Uh, you've heard about the Jaguar that's, cr that's crashed in the Solway Firth, haven't you? And he said, yes, I have. He said, And I said, well, what no one knows is that um, that, that Jaguar was carrying nuclear weapons. And uh, we, the RAF regiment are going to be deployed to send a, a, a crash guard out. The thing is, the Solway Firth, a tidal estuary, so we need someone to be fully suited up in an immersion suit with flippers and everything. So this poor guy was put through um, submersion tests in the tank wash. Uh, we had him, we had him jumping and doing sit-ups to make sure that his his air crew immersion suit, which we got from a skip, <laughs> was, uh, was um, fully um, was, was um, fully um, waterproof. We sent we sent them for uh, radiac background readings down at the the the, uh, the RAF section that did ground defence training for the Blue Air Force. We sent them to the um, <laughs> we sent them to the account section where one of my corporals had his his wife was working in accounts, and she said, "Okay, we need you to open a bank account run at the local bank uh, to take to pay your danger money." And and he said, "Well, well can't you just get, give me the, the money?" And she said, oh, no, no, last time there was an overpayment on, on this, this mission. And he said, well, if there's an overpayment, I'll just give you it back. <laughs> and she said, oh, the last guy didn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and so he's, walk, he's walking into the bank you know, in full assault gear with a rifle. Unfortunately, the bank are, are, are uh, friends of ours, and they're already warned off, so they have a laugh. He's got a flashing light on his helmet. Uh, for for the SBS to come and collect him by helicopter, and uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, the the poor guy was just stepped down uh, in readiness states from immediate to ten minutes to half an hour to yeah, you know, and he never really found out. But that was that was kind of setting the scene, the rivalry for for me going off to work with the RAF police. We had a good time there, 
I got my first uh, dog, an old field attack dog, which was, um, uh, say, failed. He failed in his night work, and uh, he became a, a firm family friend. Um, but, yeah, the, the RAF Regiment got involved in, in a lot of different stuff. You know, I was one of perhaps 500 uh, officers who got sent to be military observers uh, during the Cambodian Civil War. So suddenly in, in another uh, hot and sweaty place, a lot less fun, a lot, a lot more uh, challenging. Um, but yeah, I got a good, good grounding in, in you know, working with people from all sorts of backgrounds there as well. So it was, uh, it was fun. So and, and, I, I, don't, I, I don't know where to start with all of that, Ian. So I, I'm starting with two tribes because that's what you put into my head right at the beginning uh -huh. of this. Um, and I can remember in the early 80s, the, you know, the brochure Protect and Survive. Exactly. Which was, you know, hide under the stairs and put some tape on the windows. It'll be great. Don't forget, for to, don't forget to whitewash your windows first. <laughs> oh, OK. I was very young, so I, I wasn't fully up on all the protocols. But I can tell you now, it was genuinely terrifying. I mean, we were talking about that at school. And um, meanwhile, you're having a pina colada in the West Indies. Is this what you're telling me? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it was certainly. I, mean, I I knew very little really about the um the the RAF regiment and, and what they got up to, but as I said, it was the, the the power of this guy's charisma and and the the way that um his officers uh, admired and respected him. You know, it was very um yeah, it was very charismatic. And and uh, yeah, I thought yeah, I want a, I want a slice of that. I want to work with people like this. And uh, the. The RAF regiments never let me down. You know, they're they're, they're good people. Um, you know, um, <laughs> with a good sense of humour. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So, d d do you know this chap that you got like suited and booted for? You know, getting into the water and all this. You know, it's ten minute stand down. It, 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 you never know. He may even be a listener. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I I I think if I thought hard about it, I'd probably be able to remember his name, but I probably shouldn't mention it. Uh, all I'd say is, fella, if you're out there, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> so we have to find this chap. I think he's, he's, he's entitled to a bit of revenge, isn't he? Really, let's be honest. <laughs> so you left, how long were you in the RF for? 27 years. Yeah, 27 years. And and now uh, obviously things changed a lot during that time. The Cold War ended for the time being. Uh, and then we found ourselves in um, you know expeditionary warfare, so I, I served in, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, did two tours in Iraq, uh, did one tour in Afghanistan towards the, the end of my time, where I was um, responsible for the um, uh, security and protection of uh, Camp Bastion, which was at the time massive. You know, it, I think it was uh, the size of the city of Reading and as busy as Gatwick Airport. So there was an awful lot of stuff going on there, you know, protecting it from, uh, you know, mortar attack, intruder attack from criminality, smuggling, all sorts of stuff. And, uh, you know, we were on, only 15 minutes drive before before um, from the, the, the green zone. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was quite challenging keeping keeping the bad guys away and keeping um, the, the aircraft that were coming in now operating. Of course, a, a real even then a, a, a very real rivalry between the, the army and the RAF regiment because you know we were we were well equipped and very much focused on what we were doing and only 15 minutes away um the the army were involved in a, a you know a highly kinetic tactical battle down in the green zone against the Taliban but we had to we were we were fighting a a, a proactive defensive strategic battle to stop you know a, a big aircraft getting shot down on approach to bastion um, and, and that meant we had to be way beyond the wire, contrary to what the, the army or the Marines would say. You know, we'd, we'd be 10, 15 kilometers from the wire to stop people getting within range. So it's, um, you know, it, it, was, it was challenging. It was complex. My um, area responsibility in, in um, uh, Basra was about 650 square kilometers. You know, and, and I only had 150 guys and girls to, um, to deter uh, insurgents from coming in and, and disrupting operations. So, yeah, it was challenging. So that is, you know, I'm, is I'm proud of it. I, I can take the banter, but I'm proud of what we did. 
Yeah, I, well, my Mike, my co-host, which as you know, he'll do a little, we'll do a little introduction and we'll talk about this interview afterwards. He's always, he's always very pro the RAF, as I'm sure you can imagine as a, as a submariner. Um, so I'm sure there'll be a bit of banter there. But that sounds, my mental arithmetic, is that like four square kilometres per person? Is that what you just said? Yeah, it's something it, crazy. I mean, it's, it's, it is crazy. And of course, it's impossible to absolutely dominate it um, and, and be, you know, be everywhere. So we had to play. Um, we had to play mind games, you know, psychological operations uh, against the bad guys. I, I had um, eight snipers on my team. Uh, snipers are, you know, people think that, um, but a sniper is all about, you know, shooting someone for a long range. But in actual fact, you know, they're, they're masters of, of gathering intelligence and um, telling you what's out there when you're not there. It's very easy to go into one of the villages near Basra Air Station and, and say, any bad guys around here? And, then, and they'll all go, oh, no, no bad guys here. Um, and, and um, you know, they, they'll all smile. Most of them are, you know, genuinely very friendly and have got nothing to hide. But they are nervous of, um, you know, um, British forces from, you know, for, or forces from another country. And so I would use my snipers to um, um, just observe what was going on. One, one uh, meeting I went to, there was a, a village that kept on getting uh, mortars uh, and, and improvised rockets were being fired from there or around there. And we'd go and do a follow-up on it and find uh, no, no one had seen anything or anything like that. So we, ha- we held a, a meeting with the, the chief of this village. And normally you make a big show, you go into their, their, uh, their hut, you take off your rifle. Of course, you've, you've, got, your, you've got an automatic pistol hidden inside your your uh, your vest, but you take your rifle off, hand it to you to your guys at the door, and normally it'd just be someone with a you know an SA eighty L eighty five rifle standing at the door as a form of security. But you're in there ostensibly unarmed. Um, but one day, instead of taking um, the guy with a, a normal rifle, I took two of my snipers in their shaggy suits and uh, and had them sort of stand there. And they're observing with binoculars and noting things down. And it was very, very clearly become a distraction to the meeting, which was exactly what we wanted. And um, I said, I'll oh, just ignore those guys. And um, they're, they're my, my special soldiers. And I'm, I'm just, I'm a bit worried. And I don't want you to say anything, but I'm a bit worried that you're under pressure from the bad guys here. Um, so my uh, special soldiers, my snipers are here to protect uh, you and your family. Watch this, and took them outside, and the snipers went crawling off into the uh, the Ulu, and disappeared into the marshes, reappeared five minutes later, five hundred meters apart, and said, "These guys can shoot a man in the head at a mile. Uh, they'll never be seen by anyone else. They won't be seen by your dogs or your family. So they'll be keeping you safe." And and um, you know, so, so there's lo- lots of um, patting of chests and and shaking of hands as we we left, and I don't know. But um, I, I wonder if perhaps, you know, that, that chief got on the phone and said, listen, mate, whatever you do, don't come round here tonight. And we just put, we, we continue to, to reinforce that idea. The snipers would be in the back of the, the vehicles that we drove through the, the, um, the, the village, sitting up. And then, um, you know, when we came back through the village, uh, the snipers were gone. And we might have dropped them off and they might have stayed out there for seven days or they might have come in at last light. Or they might have been lying flat in the back of the vehicle, just hidden. Or it might not have been snipers at all. It might just have been a couple of guys with the suits on, and they take those off when they come back through. Just try, trying to make more of the resources that, that you have than yeah. you've actually got. I've got a funny feeling you might be a good poker player, but I don't, I'm not sure I want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so you left the RAF, and what did you do next? Well, as I said, you know, I, I joined up out of a, a sense of duty. And although I was I was uh, tired and a bit jaded from a, you know, a long military career, I also had a bit of a bad back. I uh, still wanted to to give, so I I was thinking about you know going straight to to charity work, and you know the obvious big military charities were were ones that drew my attention immediately, but it was um, it was a bit tough to get in there. Um, I, I, w- I wouldn't say it was a closed shop. It wasn't. It's just that the, the the staff structures were firmly established. So um, 
I actually had to cut my teeth um, by going to a, a civilian social care charity. Um, and you know, even just getting into interviews was really far more demanding and, and challenging than I had expected because I thought my illustrious military career would be something to show that this guy's a manager, a leader, he can, you know, uh, he can, he can uh, strategize and all this sort of stuff. But I was having interviews with um, um, headhunters and recruiters who were saying, well, but how are you going to um, how are you going to adapt to working within a volunteer culture? And I was, I was, I'm sorry, you know, charities have got volunteers. I said, well, the military are all volunteers. We don't have conscription anymore. And they said, yeah, but when you can't, you know, the the hand chopping signal when you can't order people around anymore. I said, that I've I've probably given two direct orders in my entire career, and that was when lives were on the line. I said, you know, we don't operate that way. We're, we're collaborative, you know, and, and, you know, anyone listening to this podcast will know, you know, we are, in, the, the whole of the military is incredibly collaborative. Everyone's got to contribute to the plan, believe in the plan, otherwise the, the plan fails and people get hurt. And I said, you know, I'm sure that's the, sa the same within charities. But they were just going, yeah, I can't see it. So um, I take a look at myself and thought, right, we're going to have to do a, a bit of a makeover. So I stopped wearing um, a smart suit and with a tie uh, to interviews. Uh, I uh, wore a sports jacket instead. I grew my hair and my facial fuzz and, and wandered into these meetings and answered the same way. And the feedback that I was getting uh, from, from um, employers was, oh, they said, you're such a wonderful guy. You'd never have guessed that you'd been in the military for 27 years. And I'm just thinking, you know, when, when I get into that organization, we will never use those recruits again. So just <laughs> crazy. But got in there, cut my teeth. I did about four years as the director of fundraising and communication for um, a, a charity. Uh, then through a bit, a bit of fortune, I, I got recruited onto the, the board of um, a dementia care home uh, down in Oxford uh, as a trustee. Um, happened to be what the the chair of my my employer uh, the charity was also the, a member of, a, of of the other board so I was um, you know I had an in there um, so started to learn about dementia care and and the governance and compliance associated with that um, got headhunted um, for a job to become a deputy managing director of a, a commercial care company which I, I really didn't like. It was private equity owned um, and, you know, money, the bottom line was everything. It's just, I was perhaps being naive going into the, the commercial sphere, but it, it didn't sit well with me. So I didn't stay there too long. And then I was just lucky enough that Erskine, uh, that my current employer um, started to look for a new CEO. The outgoing guy had been there for about seven, eight years. Uh, he decided to retire chucked my name in the hat, went for an interview. And um, I was 20 minutes down the road to drive him back home from the interview. And I was told the job's yours if you want it. Um, so I was absolutely thrilled. Wow. Well done. Before we go on to Erskine, I just want to come back to that point you made about um, you're getting a job having left the armed forces, you know, transition is, you know, yeah. what, how it's described. Do you think these kind of problems still exist? Um, in terms of, you know, the transferable skills, the way people, ex-service personnel present themselves that, you know, should we say private organisations or charities have preconceptions around what, you know, someone who's in the forces has actually done or and what the, what their jobs yeah. are, what their skills are? I, I think I think that there is, uh, unfortunately, an, an enduring sort of myth around, around the, um, you know, um, what, uh, an ex-service person is, mm. you know, ex-military people have got so much to offer. Uh, even even if they've only been in a, a year or two, and there's a real challenge here because they've not developed, you know, real uh, leadership skills. You know, whether they're, they're non-commissioned or commissioned, they're, they're, um, they haven't really developed that that tool set. But you know, they are uh, public spirited. Mm. Uh, they are they are inclined to be good team workers. Uh, they, they can follow instructions, they turn up on time, they're smart and presentable, you know, and, and those are the, the, the basics. And, and a lot of them want to be part of, um, you know, something bigger than them. And um, 
they've got so much to offer, but some of these, I'd go as far as to say prejudices and misconceptions about um, the, the mentality of someone who would join join the, the military, you know, armed forces, bare arms and everything, um, is, it, it can be a bit of a hurdle. And, you know, we, we've, at Erskine, we've actually developed um, services to help with that as well. We can perhaps talk about it later on. But, yeah, a real challenge. And in, indeed, the, um, the Veterans Commissioner up here in Scotland has actually highlighted transition from the military as being the, the number one priority for, for support from the uh, the sector and the Scottish government. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with all of that. And that's absolutely been our experience. I, I haven't served, as you know, and when we started this, I'm sure we probably had the same kind of preconceptions. But you learn quite quickly. It's, it's generally not always the case. Well, mostly not the case. So Erskine. Right, you're going to have to explain because not I, as we've already said before, our preamble before we hit the record button. I had not heard of uh, Skin. I'm in Portsmouth. I couldn't get much further away from Scotland if I tried and still be in the UK. Maybe the the Silly Isles, does that count? Or the Channel Islands? Um, but, you know, what is Erskine and what's your role? Um, it's, it's not a surprise that you say that. Uh, you know, in some respects, Erskine um, is uh, not particularly well known for the majority of the public in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> we are, however, one of Scotland's oldest, uh, probably biggest and, and, and most iconic um, veterans charities. We were formed in 1916 as the uh, Princess Louise uh, Royal Hospital for limbless sol sailors and soldiers. Um, very much uh, Scotland's compassionate response to seeing her sons returned physically and mentally shattered from industrial scale warfare uh, in, in the, um, the naval and uh, trench battles of, the, of uh, World War I. And uh, it was formed um, uh, through donations, uh, the goodwill and effort of um, the, the denizens of, of Glasgow uh, and uh, uh, surgeons and professors from the, the, uh, the university. And they, they um, got someone to donate a stately home. They raised £100,000 and they transformed that stately home into a, a surgical hospital, uh, fitting prosthetic limbs, stabilising uh, people who were returning shattered, uh, dealing with the wounds, uh, dealing with the, you know, the, the, the mental injuries as well, and then trying to give some, uh, some of these people uh, a quality of life, uh, some semblance of uh, normality, uh, in helping them return to, to City Street, albeit perhaps without legs, without feet, without arms. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, er Erskine has been very much at the forefront of the, the West Coast of Scotland's thinking in terms of, uh, you know, military charities. Um, the vast majority of our donors tend to come from the West Coast of Scotland because we've been in, in the West Coast, uh, you know, hearts and minds for a very long time. Um, and as well as supporting the, the, um, the, these uh, unfortunate soldiers and sailors who came back injured, uh, you know, physically, we were we were um, helping them find new jobs. Uh, we were teaching them skills, carpentry, uh, bootmaking, and so forth. Many of them actually were making new prosthetic limbs for uh, the, their brothers in arms who were who were returning. So it was um, it, it was really. Um, what a holistic approach that Erskine was taking, even in those days. Funny story um, relating to, we, we've long had a, 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 an association with the Yarrow family. And uh, uh, one, one of uh, the, the, uh, the Yarrow family, uh, well, the, the Yarrow, um, I'm sorry, I should have said, uh, Yarrow Shipyards on the Clyde, um, you know, well-known shipmaker. Um, during the, the First World War, there was such a delay in prosthetics uh, coming up from uh, south of the border, um, that um, the the, uh, the chairman of the Arrow Company said, "Well, sod it. We'll just we'll just close our our carpentry workshop or one carpentry workshop on the Clyde, and we'll get them making prosthetics as well." So it, it was, you know, li literally Gl Glasgow uh, opened its heart and its um, its carpentry shops to to ask and to to make sure that the people are coming back had the support they needed. A lot of people didn't, didn't ever leave Erskine. They stayed uh, in 
a sort of nightingale type ward. And if it, you think about a, an old fashioned hospital, uh, compare that to um, a barrack room of old. And, and effectively, that's what you know, the wards became. They, they, they became people's homes. Uh, and it was only um, in, in, in year two, 2000 that we actually uh, moved out of that stately home and built a purpose-made uh, nursing home for, for veterans. And of course, um, those veterans were increasingly uh, older. They were staying with us for a long time. And um, Erskine ev ev effectively evolved into uh, high-end uh, nursing, palliative and end-of-life care for people living with all sorts of different conditions, but obviously in increasingly um, uh, dementia. So we've now got four homes within um, our, our, our charity, uh, two within the Bishopton Veterans Village, uh, to just to the, uh, the, the south of the Clyde, to the west of the, uh, the Erskine Bridge, hence the name Erskine. And uh, we've got one in Glasgow in the West End in Annisland and one across in Edinburgh in Gilmerton. Um, and you know, we're, we're really proud of what they do. We care for around 800 residents a year from, from those four homes. Um, but aside from that, we've also got, we've got 44 family cottages uh, for veterans who, who um, you know, have uh, had difficulty finding accommodation or who simply want to retire to a peaceful place. We've got five assisted living apartments. Um, we've got a veterans activity center which provide, provides outreach, support, and activities for veterans in the local community who are um, encountering isolation and loneliness. And as I alluded to earlier on, we've actually begun to start tackling this transition challenge. We've built 24 ensuite apartments for young service leavers uh, with wraparound holistic support to help them find jobs, work experience, uh, and so forth with, with local employers. So yeah, really proud of it but we're still not well known. According to a survey, only 23% of the Scottish population have uh, heard of us. And I think it's probably down to the name. You know, the Princess Louise Royal uh, Hospital then became Erskine Hospital, then became Erskine. But it doesn't say Poppy Scotland. It doesn't say Help for Heroes. So you know, when it comes to what's in a name, maybe that's one of the, the challenges that we've, uh, we've yet to face. Maybe Erskine needs to grow some long hair, so to speak, <laughs> to use that to use that. So that's a huge operation. I can I can honestly say it's probably zero percent have heard of Erskine in Portsmouth, which is I'm, I'm perhaps not the end of the world for you being up in Scotland. But I think um, it's obviously a big operation, and uh, you know you as you said, the pride you express in that, and it sounds absolutely fantastic. I would love to visit one of the one of the chaps on our photography online photography workshops has been singing you personally praise and for Erskine because he uses the drop in no, that's um, nice. so you, you're doing the right thing there um given the nature of the work that and the people you work with I imagine COVID was a bit of a problem and I don't necessarily think we need to go through the entire COVID story but I think mm -hmm. how is that kind of affecting operations now and, and what does the future look like because obviously COVID is still with us it can still do yeah. some damage as we've both found out personally it can at the very least Absolutely. put you off work for some for a lot longer than you expect sometimes so what's that look like what's the future look like Ian? Well you know it's it's been a real challenge and that's an understatement but I think um, if anything good has come out of COVID which is a weird thing to be saying it certainly put social care uh, under the spotlight and the, the challenges that, that social care has been facing. Um, you know, we've, we've faced 10 years of, of austerity uh, within social care. You know, local authorities uh, across, the, across Scotland and across uh, England and Wales have, um, have all had uh, their budgets cut. I think I was, I was uh, working down south with my first charity employer when um, austerity began to bite. And I think it's something like 35, 40% cuts in, in budgets. And those kind of cuts are relatively easy to make because the majority of social care is happening in people's own houses mm. uh, and are, are in care homes. And um, th those people, by dint of living at home or living in care homes, you know, are, are hidden 
it's not in the, the forefront of people's thinking you know, when it comes to the NHS. But you know, social care and health uh, services are you know, mutually supportive and inextricably linked. Um, now, within, in Scotland, and I think it's the same in, in, um, in England as well, so the social care system, which is, you know, com commercial companies, charities, you know, all the independent providers are operating at a level that's got three times the number of bedrooms that the NHS has. You know, so, you know, and, and the NHS, I don't know what it is, is obviously caring for the, the most injured, the most sick uh, people in the country. But social care is caring for and supporting the, the most elderly, the most vulnerable through comorbidity, you know, several conditions existing uh, at, at one time, really challenging uh, an older, not, not necessarily always older, but you know, a vulnerable citizen's uh, uh, life and, and, and quality of life. So there's a, a huge, there's a huge challenge to keep people out of hospital, to keep people well, and to keep, to give them that quality of life. Um, now, when you're looking at our predominantly older uh, residents, one of the things that gives them real quality of life is visits from their family. You know, it, it's it's absolutely essential for their well-being and their life spark to 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 get uh, visits from those they love. And of course, increasingly, if they're if they're living with dementia. Uh, there may be very few people that they remember, and the people they have known longest are the ones who, who they, they recognise. So when something like a pandemic comes along and lockdown measures are put in place and visitors are kept away for long periods of time, you know, instantly, you know, some, some of those, those residents simply won't understand what's going on. Yeah. And, and they'll, they'll feel like they've, they've got nothing to live for. You know, their, their appetites go, they turn to the wall, they don't interact. You know, and of course, interaction wasn't even encouraged. So there's a real challenge within the, the, the uh, you know, nursing homes and care homes to continue to give people that psychosocial support as well as the clinical support and keep them safe and keep them stimulated, keep them well-fed um, whilst trying to... Uh, observe all infection prevention control measures mm. and you know we're, we're working with we've got in, incredibly talented uh, nurses many different types of nurses at Erskine I think we've got seven di different um, specialist roles we've got carers and senior carers physiotherapists speech and language therapists um, all which we pay for as a charity none of that is actually um, uh, paid for by um, you know, the, the, the local authority. You know, uh, uh, there's a minimal offering there, but we layer on all the, ex the expertise. They all understand what keeps someone physically well and, and mentally well, and the holistic approach is taken. So to have to try and care for people and, and meet all these requirements um, it, it is a, a massive challenge. And, and inevitably, you know, it's not like we're living in a garrison where you can lock the gates and say, okay, uh, no, one's, no one leaves base. Um, you know, our, our staff are living in the community. So this whole notion of um, throwing a ring of steel around nursing homes was, an abs was ludicrous. It was an absolute fallacy. How can you do that when your staff are going out and living in the community, mm. and their their children, uh, are, you know, are, are going off to school and so forth. And it was just so it's that that's been a, a real challenge. And of course, um, sadly, death rates did go up because you know COVID is a, a a really pernicious virus, spreads easily, and 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 strikes the most vulnerable citizens in the country who who we look after. So um, yeah, it is, um, it's been challenging, but I take my hat off to um, to my staff for how they have just worked away. They've worked like Trojans, uh, Trojans with heart to to uh, to keep people well despite these enormous challenges and despite complete lack of understanding by politicians, uh, the media, and indeed the public for the realities of social care in, in the um, in the modern age mm. when austerities hollowed it out and um, you've nonetheless got 
the um, the most vulnerable people in the country to look after. Do you think there's um, an issue there with how society views getting old and older people, or because it's kind of feels a little bit sometimes out of sight, out of yeah. mind? This, I mean, the older community became much more in the, in the wider public's consciousness because of all of this, of course, yeah. but. So do you, th- do you think that's an issue as well in terms of our relationship with getting old, if that makes sense? I, th- I think it really is. You know, you, the, 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 and of course, there's charities like um, Age UK, which, which champion the, the rights of older people. But yeah, I th- again, I think, I think the, the pandemic, COVID, was the, the, the prism that really brought all this into focus. Yeah, I, I don't know if you recall, but, you know, initially there was um, a view that um, we should allow the, the virus to sweep through the community um, to achieve herd immunity. And yes, there would be some unfortunate deaths, but mainly amongst the older population. And you know, that and that's just scandalous. You know, that's a terrible position to have. You know, that in some way um, these older citizens matter less, particularly at Erskine. I, I was incandescent and, and uh, quite vocal on social media. You know. We, we were celebrating uh, VE Day and VJ Day and talking about uh, Normandy and how, you know, uh, how the, 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 you know, the, the glorious Britain of old uh, overcame such huge, huge um, challenges and conquered Nazi Germany and bravely, you know, stormed the beaches at Normandy and everything. And then, but somehow the, those, those people, those heroes, um, the, the essence of, of British uh, manhood and, and so forth were being cared for in our homes and locked away and, and not allowed visitors. So there's a it's cognitive dissonance, really. Mm. And, and I've been a big champion for a, a long time that we really need to have a national conversation across the UK. And obviously, we've got um, you know, devolved government within Scotland but it's, a, it's a, a nationwide discussion that needs to happen about how we want to uh, be seen, how we want to be uh, measured and considered as a nation. And I think, you know, one, one of the, um, the most important measures of, of our standing on the global stage is how we care for our older citizens mm. and, and caring for older citizens costs. So there's a whole conversation around resources and how we, we pay for that. Um, you know, whether it's taxation or whether it's development of uh, national care services, which the, um, uh, the Scottish government's looking at here. But ultimately, you know, are older and vulnerable because not, not everyone is old, but they still have a, a vulnerability. You know, citizens are citizens in their own right. They have rights and they, have, they, they deserve a quality of life and protection. And, and we've really got to, you know, bite the bullet and, and decide how uh, we make suitable and appropriate resources available to people to live well, ideally within their own communities, with their own families, where they get that support, you know, for as long as possible. And then to make sure that when they can no longer live at home, that the, the right sort of level of support, the quality of care, that wraparound psychosocial support that Erskine prides itself on is available for everyone. I'm very lucky. I can leverage uh, Normandy and, and um, you know, uh, the, Scotland's martial history and, it, and its fondness for, for it, its veterans to make sure that our veterans get the quality of care that, that Erskine prides itself on. But everyone in Scotland, everyone in the UK, when they get to that age, deserves that kind of care, in my opinion. So there's big conversations to be had. I couldn't agree more. And it sounds like you're the right person to have it, I think. Um, so finally, the future for Erskine. What what does that look like, do you think? Can we do that five, ten year thing, assuming we don't have another pandemic thrown in just for <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely. Very, very happy to talk about that. Um, one of the biggest successes, um, <clears throat> you talked about it earlier on, is our, our drop-in centre. We've got the Erskine Reed McEwen Activity Centre. Reed and McEwen were two gentlemen who helped form um, Princess Louise Scottish Hospital. Um, and we took uh, the old um, stable block from the stately home that was donated. We kept that. We, the, the stately home is now a hotel. Uh, it's not ours. But we kept the stable block. And we turned that into a veterans activity centre because we've become aware 
that there are a huge number of, of veterans in the local community up to about 30 mile from a 30 mile radius away from us um, who were increasingly uh, lonely uh, and isolated. Um, perhaps as a result of age, mobility problems, bereavement, uh, sensory impairment, you know, their, their, their sight or their hearing was beginning to go, um, perhaps at early stages of dementia. And all these things um, could combine to actually present people with, with um, a, a real uh, sense of isolation and loneliness, which was just a vicious cycle. Yeah. So we, um, we created this Veterans Activity Centre where we do uh, woodworking, carpentry, art classes, um, pottery and modelling, um, music making, uh, archery, rambling, uh, we've got a relaxation therapy and talking therapy place. We, we've got an IT suite where we can teach the old and bold how to use computers and get in touch with um, uh, their family overseas, genealogy and so forth. And um, where they can get a hot meal at lunchtime and a brew all day. Now, people come along to that and it's been a huge success. Um, and we, we thought if we could get 80 people coming regularly, um, it, it, you know that'd be that that'd be good enough. But we've got pe- nearly two hundred people coming regularly, um, and they come along for different reasons. That the, they're you know to to learn these skills or to be involved in these different activities. But the real magic happens when they sit down together with a brew, and it doesn't matter where they've come from, what age they are. Our youngest, I think, is twenty-seven. Our oldest is something like one hundred and three. Um, they've all got a common language, same sort of shared sense of, of uh, humour, sometimes quite dark humour. But you know, and they've they've been through similar things. You know, they've all met met the uh, um, they've all had a bollocking from the, uh, the the RSM or the warrant officer. They've all met a gormless junior officer, probably me in my early days. Um, you know who and and you know they can have a joke and a laugh about it. And they make friends and they make contacts. They find that they actually don't live very far from this other person. They start traveling together. They're self-empowered to, you know, to, to be more mobile, more active, more confident. And, and I've had um, veterans say to me, he talks about poker. I'm not a good poker player. Um, and, and so I can recall uh, one gentleman said to me, oh, no, honestly, this place is life-changing and life-saving. And I must have raised an eyebrow. There'd have been a tail somewhere on my face because all I had to do was grow my hair, you know. And and uh, th- this guy said, "No, really. The last time before I found out about Air Mac, the last time I crossed the Erskine Bridge from the north side of the Clyde to the south, uh, I was looking for a way to jump off." Wow. And so it's when you hear that, and you know, people are time and time again with they've been in the depths of despair. So this Veterans Activity Centre. It's far more than a drop-in. We, we do uh, support other charities to operate from there and give advice and so forth. But it's, it's, you know, it's proper psychosocial support, which is uh, why Erskine over the next uh, five years are very hopeful of being able to open uh, more centres like that, more widely across the country, uh, wherever there's a high uh, veteran population. We're in quite advanced talks with... Um, the members of the Lee and Coyle Trust up in Forres and Murrayshire, uh, not far from Inverness. Uh, there's a big uh, uh, naval, air force, and um, uh, army uh, veteran presence up there. And um, we, lo and behold, we've found an old cottage hospital, stone built, Victorian, looks very, very similar to to Ermac. And and that um, you know that uh, age status. Uh, the quality, the character of the buildings is actually an important element in, yeah. in what we offer. People feel there's a certain prestige uh, associated with it, you know, a character. Um, so we're in quite advanced discussions there. We'd like to open uh, another uh, one there. And if it's a success, as I'm sure it will be, then I would hope to roll out more activity centres in Aberdeenshire, Perthshire, Fife and Tayside, uh, and, and indeed in, in Edinburgh as well. And from there, if I can, um, my trustees have given me permission to conduct um, <clears throat> a trial of um, care at home. So basically delivering Erskine quality nursing care into people's own homes where, you know, where they're currently living. So I'd like to register 
each one of those veterans activity centres as the registered office for a, a, a home care uh, provision uh, across Scotland to reach far more people far earlier to keep them living well at home for longer. And, and if we manage to do that, I'll be very, very proud. Rightly so. Um, I think that's. I think you're going to have your hands full there. I don't think there's going to be any pina coladas on the beach anytime soon no. if that amount of work. To do. <laughs> <laughs> but there's doubtless going to be quite a lot of burn suppers and speaking events, so I'll, I dare say I'll get by. Yeah, I'm sure you'll manage. I'm sure you'll manage. And I would just like to say that's absolutely fantastic. I'm absolutely certain that your residents and the people that visit are in safe hands here. So congratulations, you've got the job. Well done for growing your hair long. Um, so that's really, really good. Just one other thing. So we're in the description below. We can put any details. So a link to Erskine's website or anything else that you, you want me to. So just send that over after we finish this uh, recording session and we can include all of that in the description below. And I'd just like to say once again, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me. Well, Mike, there was quite a lot in there, and I'm sure we're going to hear all about your fondness for the RAF. Actually, Steve, you're probably not going to. I mean, uh, there's some very, very good um, chaps, uh, blokes in the RAF um, that I know that are friends, uh, and they do a good job. I don't know many from the RAF regiments. It was really interesting listening to the first part of his interview, which talked about you know that his 27 years there uh, and the rivals he had with firstly the RAF police and then more latterly with the army uh, when they were on operational tours um so I, there was a lot that i didn't know which was really interesting to listen to and nothing like a bit of inter-service rivalry is there well in one case it was intra-service because the RAF police and the RAF regiment were all part of the same um um armed force uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. And I, I am aware that uh, the Royal Marines and the Army did look down on the RF Regiment, probably without that much justification, given what they had to do. Uh, but it's just one of those things, I think. Wow, that's a, that's almost a positive comment. Well done. <laughs> you Well, you have paid me to say that, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I like some of the stories he had. Um, brings me back to when I joined the Navy, uh, and the, the the circumstances are different now to where they when they were those days. Um, and I think that you know when the Cold War were, uh, was at its height, you know um, uh, behaviour uh, which wouldn't be condoned today, you know, was allowed was was more allowed those days. But uh, interesting to 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 reminisce a bit about that. So were they serving pina coladas on board your boat whilst it, during the Cold War? We don't drink at sea, as you well know. But, oh, of um, course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing it, that's genuine. Um, anyway, let's talk about more about um, uh, really what he's been up to since he left the RAF. Um, although I thought the bit he talked about uh, transition and the difficulties he had... Um, persuading people that he wasn't a military stereotype. And we've spoken about this before, and... Um, military stereotypes, you know, often people have a perception that you're either a colonel blimp or a shouty sergeant, but but actually 99% of the armed forces aren't like that. So um, he had to dress down, he had to take off his suit and tie, uh, grow his hair a little longer and, and, and be a bit more non-military in order to get listened to. And I thought that's probably an experience that many people listening to this have gone through as well if they've been through transition. Yeah, it's obviously when two worlds collide, isn't it? And I think it was it's growing your hair long is a great metaphor for that whole sort of shifting culture. The way things are done is completely different. And also you've had that length of experience, you know, it's worth a lot. It's just a case of how do you express that in language that the civilian universe understands? He made some really good points, though, which is, um, you know, people leaving the services, whether it be short or long, have lots of translatable skills that are much valued in the civilian workplace. Mm. And you have to get beneath this the veneer of what a military stereotype is to realise that they can add a lot of value to an organisation. And I think that... Um, uh, I mean, I've, you, know, you know that I've been doing quite a lot of work in helping people leaving the services transition into the construction industry. And, you know, this is much about telling the construction industry about what um ex the ex-military can do for them as it about, as it is about telling the military that the construction could be a good career choice as a second career so i thought it, the whole 
bit about transition should resonate with a lot of your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an ongoing issue even today, isn't it? There's still challenges finding work once you've leave, left the armed forces. Absolutely right. And and there's a big shout out to the Armed Forces Covenant, which is trying to do something about it. And the Employer Recognition Scheme, which says actually, if you A, present a level playing field, but, but value um, ex-service men and women, um, bring them into your organisation, we'll recognise that. So um, there's some good work going on, actually, to try and do it, but we're not there yet. And I doubt we'll ever be there, because but people always have preconceptions uh, until they actually meet people in the flesh. Yeah, driven very much by film and TV, isn't it? It's yeah that yeah well I'm as you know I'm a Samariner and everyone either thinks it's Crimson Tide or Hunt for Red October. Uh, it, it in fact the reality is it's much nearer to Dust Boat, which was the German film that was um, more realistic. But we'll, we'll we digress. So Sean, are you Sean Connery? I don't know the name of the German actor who played that part in Dust Boat. I can't do the German accent. I can do the Sean Connery accent if you want to. No, no, save that for later, please. Let's just focus. Personally, we have one charge and three. <laughs> listeners, I'm really, really sorry about that. A Mars bar, if you can tell me what film that's from, um, listeners. Anyway, let's move on to Erskine, because actually um, um, this really was the main reason for talking about it. And like you, um, uh, I, I had, you know, being a South Coaster like you, I had never heard of Erskine. And... and you know, when I was listening up, I was also looking on their website and what they were doing. And actually, it's a very well-established veterans charity in Scotland, um, uh, the largest and one of the oldest. And it's, I'm, I'm having been based in Scotland for a while, I'm really surprised I hadn't heard of it. Absolutely. I mean, the reason why um, we had Ian on the podcast, because it was a suggestion by Mandy from the RNRMC that, you know, there was this fantastic charity in Scotland. Um that might be worth worth us having a chat with. So until she mentioned it, knew absolutely nothing about it. Oh, well, well done, Mandy, for doing that, because I think it was well worth um, doing that. And actually, if this podcast can do a little bit to raise the profile uh, and awareness of Eskin, particularly in Scotland, then that would be uh, a very good thing indeed. Um, interesting, because you talked about COVID, um, uh, and of course, you know, uh, Eskin being in partly in the care home um, industry... Uh, that's part of what it does, um, suffered hugely during COVID, big challenges, and, you know, and uh, and largely, um, you know, uh, valiant efforts unrecognised. Yeah, I th- well, that's true across the sector, I think. But also, Ian was very sort of, I'm sure he's expressed his opinions. He said he had on Twitter that, you know, there are some major challenges within the social care sector that still remain unresolved. Yeah, and I I would guess that they are pioneers in how this should be. And we'll come on to the future plans in a, in a minute because I thought they were quite inspirational. Look, you've heard me say this, an RAF person being inspirational. That's there. You've heard it um, first. On Mike, you are aware that we're recording this and people will know that you've said that. Well, I, I said it about Mandy, actually, as well, the, um, um, the first female or second female f- fighter pilot. So um, uh, it's not just exclusively one person. Uh. Anyway, let's talk about. They, I mean, they're doing. Uh, no, I mean, they're, they're not resting on their laurels. They, they, they. You know, on top of their four four care homes, I think they've got twenty four transitional. I love the idea of this transitional accommodation. They've got twenty four uh, rooms, I think, or apartments uh, for people leaving the services. Just a, uh, you know, particularly the younger members who just don't know what they want to do and just need some shelter. You know, Maslow's Triangle, a roof over your head is one of the most important things. Um, just providing that, I think that was really, really clever, and, um, and it'd be interesting to see how that, um, you know, pans out. Um, but also this activity centre they've got, um, which I think mirrors all the philosophy behind the company of makers. You know, get people using their hands, doing things, getting involved, meeting other people, uh, reducing isolation, reducing, you know, the anxiety that comes with isolation. I, I think that was fantastic. Yeah. I, well, you know, I'm going to agree with this, but I do think the idea that if you can get people interested into an active, get in, people interested in an activity, then that that creates the opportunity to help and support people because you build relationships with people through a mutual interest. Absolutely, and it's relationships that keep away, you know, um, you know, or help with mental health issues. Um, you know, strong, stable, 
you know, uh, positive relationships. So, um, and these centres help create that. So that's really good news. Um, there's something that Ian said that I, I uh, violently agree with, um, which is um, which is talking about care in general, um, and the idea that actually what we should do is help people to live at home as long as possible. So we provide a care package that comes in to let, enable them to remain in their familiar surroundings, in their home, with, with you know, w with presumably neighbours and things of people that they, they, they're aware of, and then only bring them into a care home when that's no longer possible. I, and, I, and I do think that he's, he's absolutely right about that. Uh, and when he started talking about the future, about um, being given permission by his trustees to use uh, a home care provision trial um i think that could be a blueprint for uh if if it's not being done elsewhere uh for the care sector to be honest yeah i think you know the familiarity of your circumstances being with family members can only be beneficial i think the idea of being in a care home certainly doesn't appeal to me at my at my stage in life and i'm sure doesn't appeal to most people the Dutch do this. The Dutch um, have a system called Bertzog, which are roving teams of nurses and care um, um, professionals who go to, into people's homes and actually do primary care and um, and social care as a combined package um, in, in at people's homes rather than make them come into another building. Uh, for it and and it's called Bertzorg if people want to look at it and and I know that I think the NHS are uh, looking at that uh, with the potential of doing a pilot somewhere but it's it really works it's really in the last five years it's really sprung up um, well in the Netherlands um, well worth looking at. Sounds sounds like an excellent idea. I think you're going to need to spell that for us at some point but we can do that afterwards. <laughs> yeah but I mean his plans for the future um, he's got one activity centre He's looking to open several more in different cities around Scotland, um, um, and and then this home care provision trial. I mean, he's not he's not sitting on his hands, is he? No, I mean, I think the thing that really came through is his passion and commitment to supporting the veteran community in Scotland. I mean, it was palpable, and things need to change as well more broadly. And he's quite he's quite keen to express those opinions, and I think that's a good thing. Change is needed. Yeah. So. Last thing, um, and actually this is a question for the listeners to think about. He uh, teed up the idea that we need to have a national conversation about how, we're, how we care for our older citizens in general um, and how we should pay for it as well. And I just thought, wh why not, um, if you're listening to this, if you're, if you're still are listening at this point, um, why not tell us what you think? How should we, how should we as a society care for our older citizens when they start to need support and how should we pay for it so let us know your thoughts on any of the social media platforms that this gets published on let us know what you think about how we should care for older people and you know and what Erskine are doing should we be doing that elsewhere as well you know this home care provision um, should we should we be trialing that in England and Wales and Northern Ireland for instance um, so let us know your thoughts on social media Yes, please. And as usual, the links to all the social media channels will be in the description, but we would love to hear what you've got to say and what your thoughts on this subject. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Steve. Um, can you find any more RAF people like that? Uh, that's my mission in life, to find you more <laughs> RAF people. But thank you, Mike, for your time again. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for listening. The Royal Navy and Royal Marines charity exists to support sailors, marines and their families for life. If you or someone you know could do with some support, give them a call on 023 93 87 1568 or drop them an email on support at rnrmc.org.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to hear more, please subscribe. <laughs>